ਕਿ ਜਿੰਦਾ ਕੋ ਖਾ ਜਾਏ ਵੀ ਚਾਹ ਤੋਂ ਜਿੰਦਾ ਕੋ ਰਗਲੇ ਕੋ ਤੋਂ ਆਪਣੀ ਮਾਸ ਖਾ ਕੇ ਦਿਖਾਇਆ ਕਬ ਕਹਿਣਾ ਗੋੜੀ We have heard stories of humans resorting to desperate measures in order to stay alive. One of them is eating another human's flesh, but there are some who prefer human meat over any other. We call them cannibals. The harrowing stories of cannibalism that have surfaced over the decades are not for the faint-hearted, but one tale is so bone-chilling that it's impossible to believe. We are talking about the Boyd massacre, where 70 people, including women and children, were sailing from Sydney to New Zealand. However, they had never expected what fate had in store for them ashore. In this video, we will reveal what happened to the English vessel Boyd and its passengers and unveil places on earth where cannibals are still thriving. The Boyd was an English vessel of 500 to 600 tons, owned by George Brown and under the command of Captain John Thompson. The ship set off from London on March 1809 with convicts that were bound for New South Wales. The Boyd arrived at Port Jackson, Sydney, the following August, and then, under charter to Samuel Lord of that port, set sail for New Zealand. Although the ship already had profitable cargo, the captain wanted to take on spars for the Cape of Good Hope and selected Wangaroa as the port of call. That was the first mistake they made. There were about 70 people on board the Boyd and among them were a few Maoris. Out of the few, one was Tara, also known as George. He was a young chief of the Maori tribe. The Maori are the native Polynesian people of New Zealand, Aotearoa. They descended from East Polynesian settlers who arrived in New Zealand through multiple canoe journeys between approximately 1320 and 1350. Over many centuries of isolation, these settlers created a unique culture with its own language, mythology, crafts, and performing arts, distinct from other Eastern Polynesian cultures. Some early Maori migrated to the Chatham Islands, where their descendants became known as the Moriori. New Zealand's other indigenous Polynesian group. The early conflict between European settlers and the Maori tribe in New Zealand, known as the New Zealand Wars or the Maori Wars, primarily occurred in the 19th century, and it is said that the two coexisted amicably in the 18th century. However, what we are about to tell you will change that perception forever. The Maori tribe was proud and viewed themselves as the owners of the land. European settlers were looked down upon as outsiders or invaders. However, the European settlers were technologically advanced and well-versed in underhanded tricks. It took them some time, but they eventually captured everything Maori had and turned them into a marginalized sect. In the first ever meeting between the Maoris and Europeans in 1642, four of Dutch explorer Abel Tasman's crew were murdered and the locals had to be driven off with canister shots before the Europeans could escape. Another time in 1772, French explorer Marc-Joseph Dufresne led a two-ship expedition to explore New Zealand and established good relations with the Maori. The first few months were smooth, but the locals ultimately turned hostile and butchered the explorer and 25 of his crew. It was against this backdrop that a ship set sail for New Zealand in December 1809. That enterprise was destined to end in an even more gruesome feast of human flesh. Tara had traveled overseas and served as a seaman more than once on European vessels. J. L. Nicholas, who accompanied Samuel Marsden on his visit to the area in 1814, describes Tara as the face of the man bespoke him capable of committing so atrocious an act. His features were not unsightly, but they appeared to veil a dark and subtle malignity of intention. and the lurking treachery of a depraved heart was perfectly legible in every one of them the englishman who knew him revealed that tara was fond of alcohol and that greatly affected his character and disposition many believe that tara the chieftain's progeny only agreed to work his passage home because the ship was sailing to wangaroa bay his home what truly happened to the boyd crew is a mystery because there were hardly any survivors to tell the tale However, we have accounts from different people, and most of them agree on one story, the most tormenting of all. It seems that once the ship set sail, Tara got into trouble with Captain Thompson. The captain maintained a strict code of discipline that was difficult for Tara to adhere to. This discipline was typical of European ships crewed by rowdy, hard-hearted brutes. Harsh physical punishment was meted out at the slightest offense. According to the tale, Tara refused to do a task assigned to him because he was ill. 
Some say he refused to work because he was the chief's son. Another account states that the ship's cook accidentally threw some pewter spoons overboard and pinned the blame on Tara to avoid flogging. Another report suggests that it was a slight theft. Whatever the reason, the ship's captain gave the order for Tara's flogging and he was lashed 25 times with a cat of nine tails, a type of multi-tailed whip historically used as an instrument of punishment, particularly in the British Royal Navy and the British Army. The whip consists of a handle, usually made of wood, to which nine knotted cords or leather thongs are attached. The name Cat O Nine Tails is derived from the whip's nine tails. The whip was strong enough to shred the skin of a man's back and even the flesh underneath. Tara did not take this punishment lightly, especially after the onlookers leered and jeered at him, piling humiliation upon his pain. Interestingly, this incident occurred at the beginning of their journey, so by the time the ship docked at Wangaroa Bay, everyone on board, including the captain, had forgotten all about it. Little did they know that Tara had been brewing with anger all that time and had silently planned an act of revenge that would shock the Europeans. Tara continued his duties in sullen silence, and the captain sailed the Boyd into the tree-trimmed Wangaroa Bay in blissful ignorance. Tara's father had eagerly been waiting for his son to come back. As soon as the ship anchored, his warriors quickly paddled across the water in their narrow canoes and climbed up the ship's sides to greet Tara by rubbing noses, as was their custom. The captain decided it was wise to let Tara and a few crew members go ashore to collect the valuable wood they had traveled so far to find. Tara then returned home in the Maori canoes, finally going back after a long time away. It should have been a joyful reunion, but after the initial greetings, Tara pulled his father aside. His voice was low, seething with anger as he revealed the captain's unforgivable cruelty, showing his father the unhealed wounds that marred his body. The chieftain's nostrils flared in fury. Every instinct told him to storm the ship and tear the captain apart for this disgrace. But Tara had a plan, a plan soaked in vengeance far darker than a simple assault. The idea took root and spread throughout the tribe, and soon the warriors were consumed by a thirst for blood. For three long days they held back, their restraint only sharpening their hunger for revenge. Each passing hour built the tension, like a storm gathering strength before the strike. On the third day, the chieftain made his move. With deceptive calm, he invited the captain to send a party of men ashore, luring them with the promise of a rich supply of carry trees waiting to be felled. Captain Thompson, unsuspecting, dispatched five men to the designated spot. The moment those men disappeared from the ship's view, the Maori unleashed their wrath. The five crewmen, isolated and unaware of their fate, were swiftly clubbed to death in a brutal ambush. Their lifeless bodies were dragged away, destined for a fate more horrifying than any of them could have imagined. The Maori's vengeance had begun, and it was only the start of their bloodthirsty retribution. They took the crewmen's clothes so the Maoris could use them as disguises for the next stage of the assault. After nightfall, the Boyd's crew spotted their crewmates returning from ashore in a canoe. They were immediately relieved to see them. But as soon as the watch officer oversaw the canoe's approach and his five shipmates climbed back aboard, he knew something was terribly wrong. Before he could say or do anything, he was mercilessly clubbed to death. He was the first to many who'd feel the wrath of the Maori. Some crew members managed to climb up into the rigging before they could be spotted, but what they saw took their breath away. The vengeful islanders continued to butcher everyone on board and dismember them for the great feast being prepared. Can you imagine the terror those hidden above must have felt? By morning, the islanders had left, allowing a chance for those hiding up the mast to come down. That's when another chieftain, Tepahi, approached the ship in his canoe. This one was more inclined towards Europeans. Tepahi welcomed the survivors onto his canoe, his face calm as they pushed toward the shore. Relief washed over the Europeans, but it was short-lived. Suddenly, they spotted two Wangaroa canoes slicing through the water and closing in fast. Panic set in as they realized they were being hunted. Tapahi urged his canoe forward, racing against time to get the survivors to safety. The shore grew closer, but so did the pursuing canoes. With a final burst of speed, he managed to get them ashery, shouting for them to run. The Europeans scrambled for cover, their hearts pounding as Tapahi watched helplessly from the water. 
He could only stand by as the Wangaroan canoeists stormed the beach, their eyes fixed on their fleeing prey. One by one, the survivors were caught, their desperate attempts to escape proving futile. The air was filled with the sound of struggle and final, terrified cries, until there was only silence. All but one of the Europeans lay dead on the sand, victims of a relentless and unforgiving pursuit. It is said the only survivors of the Boyd massacre were the ones who had shown Terra compassion and friendship after he received his sadistic punishment. The Boyd Massacre, also known as the Boyd Incident, was a tragic and significant event in New Zealand's early colonial history. It was a pivotal moment in the early interactions between Maori and European settlers, leading to repercussions that echoed for years. Despite being considered repulsive by the majority of the world, cannibalism is still very much alive today. People turn to cannibalism for various reasons, ranging from religious ceremonies to an extreme, desperate need. Believe it or not, but here are some places where the practice still continues. Number 1. Papua New Guinea In western New Guinea, along the Nderam Kabur Reeves, lives a tribe called the Korowai. Cannibalism, once practiced by prehistoric humans, persisted into the 19th century in some remote South Pacific cultures, particularly in Fiji. Today, the Korowai are among the few tribes still believed to engage in eating human flesh. Living about a hundred miles inland from the Arafura Sea, the Korowai reside in an area near where Michael Rockefeller, the son of then New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller, vanished in 1961 while gathering artifacts from another Papuan tribe. His body was never recovered. Most Korowai remain largely unaware of the world beyond their territories and often engage in conflicts with each other. It is said that they kill and consume male witches, known as Kahwa, within their community. The tribesmen believe mysterious deaths are attributed to demons who take on the human form, and it is their duty to consume the dead man's carcass in order to take revenge for the death. Number two, the Naihehe Caves, Sigatoka, Fiji. Known as Cannibal Island, Fiji is famous for its history of cannibalism. Although most tribes shun the practice over the years, one cannibal group is known to live in the former caves. There are many terrifying stories about the Naihehe Caves in Fiji. One of them was narrated in the book, Fiji and the Fijians. A chief's wife from a small island of Lakeba ran away in the middle of the night. After some days, the trackers, as ordered by the chief, brought her back. The chief chopped her wife's arms and cooked it. Later in the evening, she was made to sit beside him to watch her husband consuming her own arms in horror. Number three, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Cannibalism in Congo isn't a legend, but a grave reality that shocks modern sensibilities. In 2003, Sinafasi Makelo, representing the Mbuti Pygmies during a meeting with United Nations members, made terrifying claims that the Aturi province's Congolese rebels were eating the Mbuti people alive. He also revealed that Congolese rebels from the Ituri province were feeding on sexual organs, believing this would give them strength. Amuzati Nzoli, the world's most well-known pygmy, recounted witnessing a group of rebel soldiers cooking and eating his family in 2002. He described how the rebels even sprinkled salt on the flesh as they ate, as if cannibalism was a routine practice for them. Number 4. Cambodia The cannibalism practices of Cambodia will give you nightmares. During the Khmer Rebellion in the 1970s, the Cambodian troops reportedly cut out and ate their enemy soldiers' hearts and livers after the rebels were killed. The idea was to eat them on the field or back at home for dinner. They believed that eating the enemy's liver would transfer their bravery to them. One survivor of the Khmer Rouge witnessed the most bone-chilling incident in Cambodia. She revealed, Once, a pregnant woman was detained at the prison with me. She felt labor pain as she was due to deliver a baby. The cadre in charge at the prison brought her out of the detention cell. As the woman was marched onto the grounds of the prison, I could hear the piercing screams through her cell walls, and then silence. I saw a Khmer Rouge cadre who walked her out come back, and he raised his hand with a human liver and heart and shouted, Here's the liver and heart from that woman. Let's eat and drink it with alcohol. Number 5. The Ganges River, India Here you will find an exiled cult of monks who are feared across India. The Aghoris believe that they can become spiritually enlightened after consuming the deed. There was a time when this sect had hundreds of followers, but today, only 20 remain committed to this way of life. 
The Agoris live in cemeteries, practice cannibalism, and drink alcohol from human skulls as part of their rituals. They even meditate on top of corpses in search of spiritual enlightenment. Although they are cannibals, the Agoris never kill the humans they eat. They only consume bodies that are already dead. Number 6. Liberia, West Africa After the first Liberian civil war, cannibalism became rampant in Liberia. Doctors who worked in hospitals during that era reported this act and even presented Amnesty International the supporting documentation in the hopes of a thorough investigation. However, the details remained confidential, and Pierre Sain, Amnesty International's Secretary General, confessed that they were powerless to intervene in the case of dead victims' human rights violations. One former warlord who fought against Liberian tyrant Charles Taylor admitted to participating in human sacrifices in 2008. He confessed that it included killing a child, removing their heart, and chopping it into pieces for everyone to consume. Number 7. Nuku Hiva, French Polynesia In 2011, a German tourist, Stéphane Ramin, went on a traditional goat hunt in Nuku Hiva, French Polynesia. However, he never returned from his adventure, and his remains were later found near a campfire. It is believed that he was cut to pieces and burned by a tribe there who practiced cannibalism. No one knows who they are and where they live. These are places where people choose to be cannibals. However, there are instances when humans have been forced to resort to such extreme measures for survival. Such an event occurred in 1816 when the French frigate Meduse ran aground 100 kilometers off the coast of Mauritania. The crew consisted of 400 people, but there was space for only 250 people in the lifeboats. The remaining men and a woman attempted to make the journey to the African coast on a large raft. In the beginning, the lifeboat towed the raft, but after only a few miles, someone cut the ropes and set the raft adrift. The rations on the raft were limited, and on the first day the only casks of food and water were consumed. The only thing left to drink were six casks of wine. Chaos broke out, and by the end of the first day, 20 people had been thrown overboard or committed suicide. By the fourth day, only 67 crew members remained. Parched, starving, and driven to madness, the survivors resorted to cannibalism, murdering and butchering their fellow men. On the eighth day, the strongest of the survivors threw the weakest into the sea, leaving only 15 men on the raft. After sailing for four more days, the raft was accidentally discovered by a sailing ship called the Argus. Something similar happened to the crew of the Essex. In November 1820, the whaling ship Essex was hunting in the Pacific when an 85-foot sperm whale rammed it twice, causing irreparable damage. Captain Pollard, returning from a hunt, asked his first mate Owen Chase what had happened. Chase simply replied, We have been stove by a whale. Forced to abandon the sinking ship, the crew chose to head south, fearing cannibals on the nearest islands. They packed into small boats and left the Essex behind, enduring salt-soaked bread and relentless sun. After two weeks, they reached the barren Henderson Island, where three crew members chose to stay rather than continue the perilous journey. Back on the sea, Owen Chase's boat got separated when a storm struck. The lack of food and drinkable water drove them insane, and they had no choice but to eat one of their dead crew members. Eventually, they were rescued by a British ship. The other two boats faced a similar fate. Captain Pollard ended up eating his own cousin. What do you think of these terrifying real-life events? Hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and press the notification bell for more videos.